help with wildlife corridors in your garden on the website. So please check it out. We really do need to look after our hedgehogs. Gillian, thank you very much. Um, you may have just heard a big noise there. Well, it's Martin. He's got a bit dad's army on us. But I'm not really sure whether he's Captain Mannering, Sergeant Wilson, or, or is he maybe, I don't know, Private Godfrey? <laughs> something like gorse. Now, a certain amount of gorse is great, but when it gets old and straggly, it becomes a problem. Great, thick 30-year-old roots are an absolute nightmare to dig out. It becomes expensive and needs a huge investment of man hours. Now, here's the thing. So where does this magnificent tank, actually, it's an APC, an armoured personnel carrier, where does that come in? Look at this here. See these fantastic tracks? Now let's back off and see what it can do. Okay, Mike. Now that is a 14 and a half ton, 300 horsepower, 19 litre steel plow. And when Mike and the tank go out under the guidance of the RSPB into those old, mouldy areas where all the grass has got all rank and the trees have grown up. Well, this is what happens. Now, in case you're thinking that doesn't look very eco-friendly, that machine, that tank, can do work in about half an hour that would take an entire team of humans maybe a week to do. It's fantastically efficient. Now, look at this. This is the sort of thing that the tank is having to grapple with underground, these thick roots, maybe 30 years old. Once it's ground away, you end up with not much more than this. All this sort of stuff, a little bit like, like compost. Now, in fact, this isn't really what the RSPB need. They will scrape this off and they'll get back to basically ground zero, if you like. Really, really poor quality soil. But then things will start to grow there. Now, after we'd finished this morning, animals immediately dived in to try and take advantage of the exposed ground. And you can see here we've got a wren. Uh, here's a meadow pipit picking up little grubs and things from the ground, sorry, insect larvae. And here's a robin. If you've gone digging in the garden, you'll know that robins will follow you round and pick up stuff. But of course, those sort of things, the immediate effects, that isn't really what the RSPB are after. What they are looking for is what happens in spring and summer, where on the bare ground, new growth comes through. And that is perfect for the specialist animals that live here, the sand lizards, Things like the smooth snake. All of these sorts of creatures are going to benefit from that mosaic of habitats. That's what they're after. And the tank can provide the Dartford warbler, a real heathland specialist there. And, of course, the insect life, the baseline for so much of the other animals that live here. Tiger beetle, fantastic. Now, lots and lots of people were involved in this idea, but hats off to Mark Singleton from here, from the RSPB here, who had the genius idea of turning a weapon of war into a tool for conservation. That is genius. 
I second that. Genius indeed. Turning something that was made for destruction into something which is created for conservation. Top work. I've decided who he is, by the way, for oh, Dad's go Army. On. He's La Lance Corporal Jones, isn't he? Jones. Jonesy. He is a bit Jonesy. 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 Now, over the last few days, we've introduced you to our family of foxes here at Arn. And yesterday, we, we thought we had a completed cast list. They're all individuals, and we've given them names. However, last night, our story developers noticed a different fox, and it's this one. Now, as I say, we can identify the foxes by different marks on their faces or their tails or whatever. And if you look at this one, it's very nervous, it's got a little notch out of the ear as you look at it on the right. So we're calling that one Notch. As I say, we haven't seen it before, hasn't interacted much with any of the other foxes, but it is a new character to add to our growing cast list. OK, so let's try and put that cast list into some sort of context, because a lot of these animals we've seen around those carcasses, and we know that some of them are certainly in the same social group. And we've been consulting with our fox expert, Dr Dawn Scott, at the University of Brighton, and I, I feel this is a bit of an exam, actually. She's going to judge me on this. But here's, here's my theory, at least. So, cheetah, which is our female fox... Now, this animal animal has been roaming around not only by the carcasses but all over the reserve and she is certainly a dominant one. I think that's our dominant vixen because in any social group you have a male and a female which are dominant and those are the breeding animals. Now we certainly know because we saw an interesting altercation between her and Stumpy that she is dominant to Stumpy, no doubt about that. But then we also saw another altercation between Stumpy and Rogue so we know that Stumpy, if you like, that female is dominant to this female down here. But then, in another fracas, we saw Cheetah beating Rogue up. So it's not a linear hierarchy that we've got here, it's slightly different. And then there is another animal that we've noticed called Tash. Now, she is definitely part of this social group. We've seen her at the carcasses, she's interacting, they're not driving her away, but we haven't seen enough interaction to precisely judge where she stands in the hierarchy. And then lastly, of course, is our alpha male. And I postulate that this is Tyson. He's been around a lot, he's an older male, we haven't seen him with, uh, actually, with Cheetah at all together, but he... He's a big bruiser, he's got that scar on his nose, he's definitely dominant to these other animals. So I think that the carcass crew, for the moment, given the information we've got, is made up of these animals here. OK, so what about our guest stars? Well, yesterday we introduced you to Pew, which was the fox that's blind in one eye, and today we introduced you to Notch, who has Notch out of his ear. Now, we don't think these are part of the carcass crew, we think they're outsiders. We know they're males, so what's happening here is these two are probably coming in, sniffing around, because they're ready to mate. We've heard Cheetah make a lot of noise calling them barking in. down on the shore, didn't we? And so they'll probably try their luck with the cheetah. And they might succeed, because she will go for multiple matings, if she possibly can, at this time of year. What do you think Dawn will give us? Marks out of ten? Well, I don't know. She can tweet <laughs> us and let us know. I'm hoping for an A+, but I, I wish you'd got that straight like that. Oh, for goodness sake, your OCD-ness is coming. Look, there we go. We're going to really mess it up, oh, under... <laughs> Well, we've really had quite a drama with this cast of characters here. <laughs> but as you know, wildlife drama can happen anywhere and sometimes in really secret places. I mean, on Tuesday, we showed you a mouse giving birth in the attic. That's what I like to call call the midwife, OK? Mm, mm. And tonight, we are showing a bit of a love quest right down in the cellar. And this one is a bit like pole dark with insects, but maybe not quite so sexy. The basement. Warm, dry and dusty. Heat from the old boiler keeps it snug, creating a welcoming glow. And a forgotten pile of books provide a literary lair for an unassuming addition to our homes. 